I've been, I've been, I've been dabbling a lot more into like economic history now. So one thing I discovered, like, I don't know if you know a gentleman by E.B. Tucker. He wrote a book recently about gold. Mm -hmm. Uh, So basically he was talking Mm -hmm. about back, his grandfather was telling a story how in 1930s, I believe in the United States, they basically required citizens to give back the gold to the United States Mm -hmm. because they were going, they were going off the, the gold standard. So it was a period of time where it, the government was just showing a point that in order for it to do what it wanted to do with the artificial monetary system, they kind of, I, I don't know, I guess some people could say an artificial monetary system was developed, but it had to do a swap in order to hedge itself before doing that transaction. And then there's a, um, and then I was looking at Japan, just looking at it context, because now that we're in North America, we're near zero interest rate. I was looking at Japan and Japan's history is 1989, the stock market peaked. And then 19, so 1989, it peaked 1999 interest rates went near zero 21 years later in 2020, it's now negative and it's only been dealing with a a ton of negative economic problems. And then you look at North America, massive bubbles in the asset classes, similar to what we saw in Japan in 1989, you have Mm -hmm. the federal reserve that's stimulating the market, which is somehow propping it up because without it, the market would come down. It just, it just wouldn't have the liquidity. So I'm just seeing a similar pattern occurring from so long ago and then emulating it to Europe and Japan. And it's like, there's something's wrong here. I just, I'm, 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 I don't feel comfortable as someone who cares about the value of my dollar and Mm -hmm. throwing it into these markets now, because it's just bubbles, especially when you see so much disconnect socially, politically, economically, it's like at those times, I feel like that's when you should have the biggest confidence in getting Mm -hmm. out not indulging mm-hmm. it more because usually throughout history, the biggest busts come from the biggest booms. Every nation mm-hmm. has always fallen. Every civilization has fallen. And it's usually comes at a time where people get too comfortable and then they start to clash. So uh, the economic history has so much given me confidence in my desire to add more value to the philosophy of precious metals. So I'm fully solidified in the idea and the thesis of what precious metals are in my value as a as an economic entity in this world. Good. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. I mean, it's encouraging to, to, for you to recognize that so soon. And I think right now, you know, a lot of people are always looking for like a practical, like you've done your research, so you understand and you've purchased it, you felt the yeah. value and all that. But some people are always looking for a practical example of why precious metals make sense. And I like to give them the following example, especially people of our generation, because we were old enough to understand and to witness what happened. If you look at 2008, when the financial crisis occurred, it was a global crisis, but here in in Canada and in the United States, most investors lost about 30 or 40% of their net worth in about a year to a year and a half period. If you were heavily invested in the stock market or in real estate, you saw a major dip in, in the value of your portfolio. And especially damaging to people who have like pension plans, like fixed pension plans and things like that. Gold at during that period of time from 2008 through 2011 went up in value 140%, 140%. So stock market goes down 30 to 40%. Gold goes up 140%. Silver goes up 350% during that period of time. So again, that's a very, you can look at it in the graphs, in the yeah. charts, it's all there. This is, this is factual. So if you're looking for a reason or a historical based reason to own gold or silver, it's to hedge against these crisis periods, these periods of uncertainty, which is what you were describing. Yeah. We're teetering on the edge of one of those periods. And we saw it happen. COVID was a trigger, something that was meant to happen anyway. Yeah. COVID was like this black swan event that nobody could ever predict. Nobody could you know, predict that this, yeah. we were going to be shut down for a year. But from March of this year through October, we saw a record demand for precious metals. It was insane. The market was absolutely on fire. We would wake up every day. We knew we had a 12-hour day ahead of us. It was going to be nonstop, six weeks delivery for orders. It was crazy. And it, it, just, it just goes to show when we go into these crisis periods, the benefit of gold and silver. And again, these are things that people that aren't sure about it, they're like, are these guys telling the truth? Go look at the charts. The numbers are there. I, I believe that one of the biggest principles 
associated with the philosophy of precious metals is people's horizon. So a lot of younger people, especially because their horizons haven't established, they haven't understood the, the, the principle of having a long-term horizon. So the appeal of gold doesn't seem to align yet because they're too short-term sighted. But once you start having a longer term framework and understanding the premise of sustaining wealth, preservation of wealth, then it starts to appeal more and more. So I think that one of the biggest disconnect, especially from the younger generation is the principle of lack of understanding a time frame and the horizon of the asset class. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not, you can't, it's not for trading. I mean, you could trade it. I, I trade it casually sometimes on the market with the U against the USD, but in terms of real storing of wealth and all that stuff, it's it, the, the, the thesis of it is entirely different. It's not something that us, it's easy to sell a stock, a, a hype. Uh, you can, it, it, I think it, it, our generation is a little more into the gambling of stuff and the quick stuff. So stock kind of has become that appealing component of it. Right. You know, so, and it's hard. So, nobody, look, nobody talks about gold, you know, either. You, you, you can, you can, you can gamble on gold. There are, there are two ways you can gamble on gold. One, you can buy mining stocks. So yeah. especially junior mining stocks, these are companies that are, their track record is not yet proven. They're trying to raise capital to fund their operations and pull metal out of the ground. It's a very dangerous investment in the sense that if you pick, you're not investing in gold, you're investing in a company. So if that company does not perform and pull enough metal out of the ground, you're not going to make any money. And in most cases, when it comes to the junior mining stocks, like eight out of 10 of them aren't going to make, aren't going to make the returns that they promise. Yeah. They're not going to find the gold that they set out to find. If you happen to hit the two that do, you're going to do very well. Yeah. You could go into the more, you could also go into the more blue chip mining stocks, mining companies that have been around a long time. They have operations all over the world. They're very well established. And those are good companies to add to your portfolio long-term. But again, it's, you need to understand the, disti the distinction yeah. that you're not actually investing in gold, the commodity, you're investing in a company and a board of directors and their employees and the way that they spend money, the way that they allocate their capital, all those things. So you need to do your research and pick the right companies. So it can you be challenging, especially for young investors. The second way is the ETFs. If you want to go in and out quickly, look at ETFs, look at RBC's precious metal fund. You can trade it like a stock. But remember, again, you don't own gold. You own a share in a fund. So you don't own the underlying asset. So there is still risk that comes with that. And you will never be able to convert that into the coins and bars that you've purchased recently. So again, there are yeah. ways to do it, but physical precious metals is kind of the longer term buy where you own the physical asset and it's your personal property. You remove all risk from the equation. I, I entirely agree with that. The only, the only way I would ever see myself, or I mean, I, that's what I'm doing. And that's what I'm personally recommending with terms of my advisory is that if you touch equities, you're looking at gold more for a cash flow purpose in terms of certain, but I only from royalty perspective. So like mm -hmm. Franco Nevada, the royalty, Metalla, the royalty. Mm -hmm. So if I touch equities, it's more for the, the royalty principle of it, because you don't have direct exposure to all the operational expenditure mm -hmm. and and risk, but you get a direct cash flow purely from the ounce pulled out. So from an equity perspective, and then you have the fast liquidity component that you can easily sell your stock as well and dividends increase over time. So, I mean, from an equity perspective, it's, I find that would be the only way I would kind of really, and if I were to do mining, it's a basket of juniors, because like you said, most of them will end up doing terribly. So if you want to offset mm -hmm. that, you have to basket the allocation, which then requires more capital or very little bit, a little bit of capital. And then again, there's nothing like the feeling of actually owning gold and silver, because it actually does feel different. It, uh, it solidifies the, it solidifies the feelings. Once you own it, you get, I get it now. We all did it. Me and my group, we all started doing it my clients. And then it's like, okay, I get it, Nick. I'm on the board with you. Let's do this. Yeah, so exactly. The, I bet you if you, if you showed up with some ounces and put them in your friend's hands, they'd start to, to buy into, to what you're, what you're talking about.